The following program was produced by a community producer. The content, views, and opinions expressed are the sole responsibility of the community producer and do not reflect Malden Access Television, the City of Malden, or your cable provider. MATV welcomes your comments. Call us at 781-321-6400 or email us at access at matv.org. All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, BB School. My name is uh, Gary Christensen, Mayor, although after the first four weeks, I'm starting to wonder about that title. Uh, let me just say at the outset, I'd ask everyone to please place your phones on vibrate, and I'd ask you to keep your uh, conversations to a minimum uh, for tonight's um, Public Safety Awareness Forum. Uh, what I'd like to say at the outset is that uh, this is something we plan on doing uh, just not during times of emergencies, but rather uh, each and every month uh, for the next four years. Uh, so at this point, I can tell you that um, the next forum will be held on Monday, February 27th at 6 p.m. at the Oak Grove Community Center. So we'll be heading over to uh, Ward 4 next. And uh, the purpose of these forums is to kind of talk about what's been going on out in the streets for the past 28, 30 days, and then what we see coming up in the next month. So you always have an opportunity uh, to know uh, what's going on around you. Um, I'd also say at the outset that uh, if you have an opportunity, if you haven't already, please like our uh, Facebook page, City of Malden Official uh, is the page. And also, we now have a Twitter account set up for the City of Malden, which we'll be using as another means of communicating with you and letting you know what's going on around the city. We're also in the midst of generating a first uh, citywide email that will go out on a monthly basis, and that too will serve as another tool to make sure you're aware of um, what's happening in Malden. Uh, the other thing I'd like to just make sure you're aware of, online forums, you know, if you don't have a chance to be here tonight, please let your neighbors and friends and family members know that we'll be doing online forums once a month as well. Uh, we just had our first one last uh, Friday morning, and the next one will be held on Friday, February 24th at uh, 10 a.m. So I'd ask you just to tune in to um, the Malden Patches, the group that's coordinating the uh, online forum. So if you log into them, you'll be able to ask uh, your questions of us as well. A um, couple other things I do want to compliment, as always, Malden Access Television. They're here tonight filming this. So again, uh, they'll be able to show this to you know our fellow residents who couldn't make it tonight. And they'll be able to hear firsthand what's going on out in the city. And that'll be uh, airing, I believe, at some point tomorrow. Uh, joined with me uh, on the stage, uh, I do want to recognize our police chief, uh, James Holland. He's here with us tonight. We have uh, Lieutenant Kevin Mollis here with us. And then, of course, your Ward 3 City Council, John Matheson. And then I see out in the audience, I believe, our Ward 3 School Committee member, Debbie D. Maria. She's here as well. So the interest is definitely there in making sure that we're all on the same page moving forward. Just a little bit about I, how I see uh, tonight going on. Uh, also, I want to recognize this Paul McClory's in the back. Paul, if you could raise your hand. He's representing Senator Kat Catherine Clark's office. So again, we want to make sure you have the resources here to address the issues that we're about to speak about. The uh, way this will work tonight, um, I do the opening greetings. Uh, we're going to give a chance for the chief to update you as to uh, where we are and where we're going. Uh, Lieutenant Kevin Mollis, who is heading up uh, the newly formed interaction unit, which started, I think, about a year ago. He'll say a few words. And then most importantly, we want to get to your questions and answers. I'll moderate that part of uh, tonight's uh, forum. And then we'll uh, wrap up uh, shortly thereafter. Also want to recognize uh, Mike Genzali. I believe Tony Genzali is here. They're from the uh, Neighborhood Crime Watch and they have information that you'll be able to take with you uh, to look over and hopefully use in your neighborhood to help us uh, reduce crime. So with that being said, uh, I would now like to turn it over to our police chief, uh, longtime Maldonian, uh, James Holland, just to let you know what's going on around us. Chief? Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. How are we all doing tonight? 
fellow residents of Ward 3 and that, because I do live in Ward 3. So uh, a lot of you know me personally. Uh, some of you don't. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Malden. Uh, over 42 years as a policeman. So um, kind of been around here a long time, so I kind of know the city and what's going on. Some of the uh, initiatives we've uh, entailed in the last year have been uh, license plate readers, which you see down here at the intersection and through other intersections throughout the city. We have a camera system that's uh, being utilized now that the city has built. Um, we, we put together a uh, force of uh, gentlemen led by Lieutenant Mollis to get out there into the streets and uh, confront most of the uh, things that are going on. Um, we're trying to um, work with the mayor in the next year's budget to add some more to the street. That's one of his promises, and we're going to try to hold it to him. And uh, I think he will back that up. <clears throat> uh, a lot of the different uh, initiatives we've undertaken have been uh, financed through uh, monies that we've gotten through grants and such as that, uh, through federal funds that have come back to the city. So uh, we've been doing quite a lot with quite a little, and I think the mayor has uh, made some promises that he's going to try to keep up that uh, uh, commitment to the police department and the city in general, which is a tough job to do. But uh, I want to turn it over to uh, Lieutenant Mollis because you're all here for information on how to protect yourselves from crime of all nature, and I think he's prepared himself in that nature. And then the question and answer period will open up and uh, maybe get more in depth into some of your specific concerns. Mm -hmm. But I want to let him make his presentation, and then we'll move forward from there. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, everybody. Uh, you, you can hear me well? Yes. OK. Um, I'd like to thank the mayor for uh, allowing me to come along at this important meeting. I know it's an initiative that he uh, placed a lot of emphasis in when he got elected and to uh, get information out to the public and also be receptive to that information from you is uh, something that's very important to him. So I'm grateful that he's including me on this. And I'd also like to thank the the chief for uh, including me on his efforts to combat crime in the city and make it a good place to live. Uh, I've lived here my whole life also, and I just realized I can say I was born in Ward 3, because I was born in Malden Hospital. So uh, I do have some affiliation with there, and uh, I think Joe Levine would remember we uh, I skated up at the pond when it froze. That hasn't happened this year. So uh, I, I do have some familiarity with Ward 3, um, and actually from the police uh, standpoint, uh, I can tell you that historically the three line of duty police deaths that happened to Malden police officers all happened uh, in Ward 3. So, um, you know, Ward 3 has a special place of honor within the Malden Police Department, and it's an area I'm very familiar with. I would uh, just like to point out that uh, you know, a recent review of, of activity in the in the ward uh, would would cause me to think of a couple of things. I mean, ward, ward three is, is kind of unique. You have the you know the, the area up around the pond, which you know offers great peace, tranquility, and, and an area that's very unique. And then uh, there's other areas that are you know, more residential orientated. And those things, two things, present a couple of uh, issues that uh, we become aware of when we're working. Uh, one area I would say that uh, is, is on the radar screen right now would be something, you know, residential house breaks. Uh, residential house breaks are something that uh, we're all vulnerable to, regardless of where we live. Uh, I have spoken to colleagues of mine from other police agencies who all acknowledge that they have experienced uh, the same phenomena, that you know, house breaks are a crime that, that uh, does happen, and it's something that you know, it, we're, we're all vulnerable to, but we can all reduce our vulnerability to that. Ward 3, un no different from any other area of the city, has had some incidents of daytime housebreaks. Um, I think we all 
for a moment if we stopped and reflected and said to ourselves that when we leave our house in the morning, is there anything that we have done to uh, minimize or reduce our becoming a victim of that type of crime? Now, when I review the particular daytime house breaks that you know happen in this area, uh, there is a pretty much common theme, and they happen when no one is home. Um, entry in most of these occasions is done by force, whether it be by using a tool or kicking a door in or forcing a window open. Uh, the person that commits the crime does not spend a lot of time inside the residence, uh, five minutes at most, and the, the items that they're looking for are, are valuables, jewelry, uh, laptop computers, you know, electronics, things that they can carry away. Uh, knowing that is happening, it's something that I think that people should be, you know, aware of in the sense of reducing their ability to uh, minimize the risk of becoming a victim of that crime. I, I think I can illustrate that point pretty graphically by an incident that happened uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, and it happened in Edgeworth, where I happen to live, but it could equally happen anywhere else. Uh, during the day, about 10.30 in the morning, um, maybe just to preface that, I'll just tell you that I work in a plainclothes unit. Uh, the chief was uh, very much the reason why this unit was created. It's a plainclothes group that goes out and targets various areas of the city where problems are occurring and we make an effort to be in the right place at the right time or try to encounter people in different situations to prevent crimes from happening. So I mean, I, I have to give the chief uh, credit for uh, putting that together and I'm one of the ones that's out there involved in that. But, you know, a, a morning uh, about a couple of weeks ago, I was working with the other members of my unit, one of them who happens to be here tonight, and uh, he happened to notice two individuals walking down a street in Edgeworth, a residential street. Now, I just want you to know that when police officers do their jobs, we are bound by the laws of the Commonwealth and the Constitution, and we are, our actions are limited by that. So two people walking down the street is not a crime and not worthy of any police intervention. But on this morning, the uh, sergeant who works with me noticed that these two individuals, uh, two males, happened to walk up on the front porch of a house. Now, he was doing surveillance of them, so not to overly complicate this, when you do surveillance, it's watching somebody without them knowing you're watching them. So, in order to do that, sometimes we have to move out of their line of sight temporarily. So on this occasion, the two uh, men go up on a porch, and the sergeant doing surveillance temporarily moves in a position where he has to come around to get back in their view, and no longer can he see them. So a, a couple of things could have happened. They could have entered the house legitimately. They might have lived there. They could have had a friend there. They could have broken into the house, or they could have walked out of the neighborhood. He broadcast that information, and that caused other police officers to come into the area. And during that time period, when they were out of sight, he was able to talk to the homeowner. And the homeowner revealed that she was aware that when those two uh, men were on her porch, she was aware that they tried her doorknob. They did not get in, but they left. So now we knew that these two people had tried the doorknob of a house and had walked out of the in the neighborhood but away from that house. So that information was broadcast out and we began looking for them. A short time later, about 20 minutes or so, uh, two people fitting that exact description were seen walking down a nearby street and one of them was heavily laden with a red bag. Upon seeing the police, they began to flee. A number of officers came into the area and was able to apprehend them when they separated, when they were running. 
and recover a bunch of stolen property, <coughs> laptop, a bunch of electronics, and a lot of jewelry. And through the recovery of that evidence, they were able to determine that they had just broken into another house. And from going to that other house, we determined that they had gone to the back of the house, the house was unoccupied, kicked in the back door, were probably in the house less than five minutes, loaded the bag up, and were on their way. Now, that would be indicative of how these crimes occur most of the time. But it also reveals something else. The two people that committed the crime were not from Malden. Um, they indicated that they were homeless uh, from a, a shelter in Boston. And through conversation with them and other evidence, there was indications of a drug uh, background. And there were also indications of uh, extensive criminal history. So. That, that would be a classic example of housebreak 101, how it happens, picking a house, checking a house to see if someone's home, coming on your porch, knocking on your door, trying the doorknob, all those indicators, going to the back of a house because it provides more cover and concealment, and the short amount of time it takes to go through someone's house and obtain valuables uh, that belong to you and not them. So that is a, a crime that, as I said, is on our radar screen is something we're aware of, something we're aware of the, uh, the frequency as it increases, and also aware that it's something that is also occurring in other places as well. So when I look here, and I know this is a Ward 3 meeting, um, and I look at Ward 3, a uh, predominantly residential area that I'm very familiar with. I would say that if there, there is uh, something that I think that you should put in your mind right now is uh, just kind of say to yourself, um, if I was going to break into my house, but you didn't live there, how would you do it? Would my house be vulnerable? Are there things that I can do to reduce the likelihood of having my house broken into. As the mayor indicated, there are people here from a crime watch group that has an abundance of information that relates to uh, how to minimize your risk of crime. And this would be a crime that there's a lot of information on things that you can do. Uh, simple things from improving your lighting, reducing the uh, amount of uh, things that make your house less viewable, large bushes and what have you, uh, target hardening the locks, the doors, the windows, and anything all the way up to the uh, efficacy of, of alarm systems. Um, I, I, I can tell you uh, that on analyzing many of these crimes <laughs> as they occur, there is a common theme that many of the houses that are victims of this crime do not have any type of alarm. I can tell you that very recently, within the past few days, there was a call in Ward 3 to a house as a result of an alarm. And when the officers got there, they found pry marks at a window, but no indication that entry had occurred. So there is uh, evidence to support the notion that uh, there are things that people can do to minimize the risk of becoming the victim of this type of crime. And when I knew I was coming to this you know, meeting, being in Ward 3, uh, knowing the recent crime trends that have occurred, that that probably would be something that would be relevant uh, to this audience and to the people not only of Ward 3, not only of the entire city of Malden, but anyone, because as I said, I've spoken to other police colleagues as early as this morning to see what their sense has been regarding this type of crime. And uh, they're all aware of uh, the, the fact that it is something that is uh, an occurrence that people should you know, be mindful of and not, not just disregard it. Uh, and as I said, uh, a common theme that 
is revealed when uh, we arrest people involved in these crimes or even speak to people involved in, in, in the uh, drug world, particularly people with drug addictions, many times the people that are committing these type of crimes have that um, in, their, uh, crim in, in their lifestyle or their criminal history and the, the, the house break is a means of financing their drug habit. And that's why they will do this on many occasions because the use of the drugs is something that happens you know, every day if they're addicted to opiates. Um, I can tell you also that I'm aware of uh, a case that happened, you know, in this area, uh, you know, months ago, in which same thing, somebody broke into a house by kicking in the, the door. Uh, it was in there less than a few minutes. Um, stole a significant amount of valuables. But in that occasion, there was a neighbor who noticed the vehicle and knew that it had no relationship to that house and was uh, responsible enough to write down the license plate. And it was only through writing down that license plate that we were able to find out who owned the car, sit on the house for four or five hours. And when he came home, it, it was him. So that, that was an example of neighbors uh, being cognizant of their neighborhood, knowing who does not belong, knowing what to look for, and also being attentive enough to write down the pertinent information that was absolutely essential towards solving, you know, that crime. Um, so that that's an area of criminal activity that I think it's, it's our obligation to make you aware of and also to assist you in any way we can to uh, uh, enhance the, your ability to, to combat that type of crime. One other thing that I often become aware of when I work this area, and we, we work the whole city, but we, we have a lot of occasions to spend time around the uh, MBTA station. And particularly late at night is something that I'm aware of, and we have had some occasions of criminal activity related to it. And it's when people are walking home from the train station at night, it is uh, sometimes amazing to see how uh, unaware they are of their surroundings. And I think the unawareness has become an, a phenomena because of cell phones and uh, listening to music. Because I have on occasion uh, followed someone that left the train station all the way to their house in a, in, in a police vehicle, an unmarked police vehicle, and they had shown no recognition of anything around them at all. So I, I would say that, that if, if you're someone who utilizes public transportation to, to uh, go to work or come home late at night, just kind of be aware of that uh, in the sense of minimizing your likelihood to be a victim of crime be, by paying more attention to your surroundings and not be so absorbed by uh, your cell phone or, or the music device that you're listening to that it makes you unaware that someone is looking at you as a potential crime victim. And I would also tell you that nationally there are trends that are showing that because phones and music devices are so uh, expensive and desirable, that just the showing that you have those devices makes you a potential victim of crime as well. So, I mean, that, that's something that I, I think people should, should also be aware of. Um, and that kind of transitions into one, one last thing that I, I think is very important, but it might seem like a small thing, but it's a, a big thing in the world of policing. And it, it's very consistent with what the mayor, and I, I also want to acknowledge Councilor Matheson, because he's someone that I actually got to know him uh, maybe four years ago. And it was when he was having lunch before he was even an elected official. And uh, we had a conversation, and it struck me that I did not even know him at the time, that when we had that conversation that he showed an obvious dedication to <coughs> community service and, and, and making his ward uh, a, a very good place. So I, I, I want to acknowledge what I know to be his commitment, because he showed that to me even before he took the oath of office. 
And when I, I mention something, now it, it's a police concept that gets discussed a lot and it's, it's called uh, broken windows theory. And it's essentially a theory that if there's small things that deteriorate in a neighborhood, it invites larger problems of crime. And I want you to, to be aware, you live in your ward, and you have a mayor who has had these meetings, and you have your city councilor here, to pay attention to your ward, and if there are things that need to be improved upon, whether it be lighting <coughs> at night, or areas of the city that uh, are deficient in any way in the, in, in the safety, or just the, the quality of life, and I'll give you an example of that. For, for a number of months, there was a, a bicycle chained to a pole at Glen Street at uh, Cedar Street, in that area. It had sat there, started to get dismantled, and it was just left there. And uh, it was through the efforts of the mayor's office and the DPW that that bike was removed. Now, it doesn't sound like a big thing, but in the larger picture of policing, there is evidence that shows that small things left neglected can lead to the perception that a neighborhood is deteriorating and it invites crime. And that can be something as simple as graffiti, um, abandoned property that's neglected, and, and, and those type of situations. Those are things that uh, a city really has a requirement to pay attention to at the earliest levels because if those things go unaddressed, there is evidence that supports that it can increase uh, levels of crime and disorder. Um, it's, it's a theory that actually is discussed at the uh, highest levels at Harvard University, so I'm, I, I'm in very good uh, grounds when I say that it is something that's very important and I know that it's something that, that the mayor and council of Matheson are very attentive to. So again, I, I, I urge you, if there are areas of your ward that you find uh, deficient in things that reflect on the, the quality of that neighborhood, whether it be lighting, uh, neglected or abandoned issues like I had mentioned regarding that, something as simple as a bicycle just remaining there for months and then getting stripped and being left there, uh, can have the negative um, connotation that uh, nobody cares. So I, I just want you to be aware to make those things known. Um, my, my background on the police also involves a, a, a significant amount of time involved in drug enforcement. I'm very cognizant of uh, the realities of, of drug use, sales, and what have you in a general sense, in a specific sense. So. Um, I would be certainly willing to uh, offer any insight into that area of uh, uh, criminal behavior if anybody has any questions. So, um, again, I want to uh, thank you for uh, having this meeting, Mr. Mr. Mayor, Council Matheson, and uh, MATV. And I would invite anyone now, as the mayor takes the helm, if you have any questions that uh, need to be addressed, we'd be glad to help you with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just a couple of notes before we get to your questions. Uh, first, the chief said it best. The upcoming budget process, we must, we will add police officers to it. Uh, we just uh, do not have the amount, we probably never will, but we can't run with the number that we have for a city of 60,000 people. So. We've already started uh, next year's planning on the budget, and uh, some way, somehow, we are going to come up with a way to add additional police officers to the department. Uh, the other thing you should know is uh, the chief has graciously uh, taken um, a morning out of his schedule each week to update me as to what's going on around the city and what steps, short-term steps, we could take now to try and assist to the department. So I do want to thank him for uh, doing that. Um, the other thing, um, we'll get to your questions momentarily, is the Housing Task Force, which I think you've become familiar with over the years. We just had the transition report delivered by the committee uh, led by Councillor Greg Lucy 
a portion of that report deals with the housing task force, which the police have told me over and over again is another aspect to some of the issues that we see today. So in the next several weeks, we're hoping to roll out a couple of changes to the task force and how it uh, keeps tabs on illegal apartments, rooming houses, people that have code violations. I will personally uh, chair that committee, that much I know at this point, but we're looking at changing up the composition and um, having a citizen as part of the uh, committee and really making sure you know, you know who are the houses that are giving us the problems across Malden. Uh, finally, um, we do want to make you aware that the duo of Council Matheson and uh, school committee member Dee Maria will be right back here on Wednesday, February 29th at 6 p.m. Uh, here at the BB School to follow up on tonight's meeting and to also start mapping out things that can be done here in Ward 3. So with that being said, uh, we'd now like to get to the most important part of tonight and that is your questions. Uh, I've been told by Malden Access Television that they will bring a microphone over to you or I believe the device you have will pick it up. Okay. So with that being said, I just want to you know, encourage you again to be respectful uh, in asking your questions. Please allow everyone to uh, you know, be able to get the information they need. So uh, first question, I'd just take a hand if I could. We'll go right over here to my left. Hi, I have a question. With the break-ins that have been happening around the city, have any of those break-ins, have any of the, um, have there been weapons? Any weapons, knives, guns? Anything like that? No, 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 no. no so it's just a break in with the break in to get things and then they're not, they don't have weapons. Okay. There's no. usually nobody home, so nobody sees the perpetrator. So it's unknown whether the perpetrator has a weapon or not. If they're, when they're caught, because like, it sounds like you've caught some of them. Yeah, we've caught, have, we've caught them. And they have weapons on them? No, not at this time they haven't, no. Okay. no. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Next question. The house behind my house uh, was destroyed by fire, and it, um, there had been many complaints about the activities in that house is that it had become a rooming house um, and because of the amount of mattresses that were being <coughs> delivered, and uh, people were using hot plates in their rooms um, because it was right on the train station. It was very convenient for people. Um, so there are other people here that have concerns about um, homes that are, are areas that are not uh, zoned for boarding houses. Um, what is the recourse? What can the public do to uh, prevent homes from being used in that manner? Yeah, absolutely right on. I, I really think that is the um, part of, you know, getting to the root of the problem. As a ward council for eight years, I was able to see firsthand how one home can destroy an entire block. And the people so, that live there are not vested in the community. Right, no They're doubt. Yeah. So a couple of things, um, you know, again, we have this report that's available on the city's website, cityofmalton.org. You can look up the transition report, and there's a section dedicated to what to do about um, illegal apartments and rooming houses and code violators moving forward. So what I plan to do now is uh, take that report and start <coughs> implementing some of the recommendations contained therein. Uh, I know right off the bat uh, that I will be, you know, personally invested in the committee. And then we're looking at changing the composition. We're looking at changing how often the committee meets. We're looking at getting outside into the city so that you might be able to one day watch the committee proceedings. Um, and then the other thing is I'm full tooling around with the idea of posting some of these problematic properties on our website. You know, uh, City of Boston's now doing that. I think Lowell's looking at doing that. So there'd be a repository, another way for you to know uh, what properties we are looking at and who are the, you know, the folks that are causing them. Um, some other things that uh, you know, we are going to do is make sure that all the key players are at the table during the committee meetings. You know, sometimes in the past, I think what happened is you know, you'd have one department there but not another. And you really need you know, most of the departments at the, uh, at the meetings to really make sure that the information is synchronized and we're all you know, on the same page. So, you know, you are correct, it's, uh, you know, it's a focal point moving forward. I think in the next several weeks you'll see some, you'll see some information relevant, relevant to the um, Mayor's Housing Task Force. Uh, the other thing we are doing, you know, for homeowners here, we, we've been pushing this over the past several years to combat people that might be coming in here and just running homes for profit, is we have this uh, residential tax exemption 
program in place. And uh, ironic enough is that uh, the Ward 6 City Council, Neil Kinnon, is entering the auditorium because he's been championed this program since he's been on the council. And basically what it does is if you live in your home, you know, you're a homeowner, you live at the address, you know, we're now reducing your property taxes on average by 20%. And uh, we started at 5%, we went to 10%, we're now at 20%, and uh, hopefully we'll be joining the cities of Cambridge and Boston as uh, the only communities in the state next year to offer a 30% discount. So the idea behind it is not only for you to save money on your property taxes and us to say thank you for making Malden your home, it's also an attempt to you know, maybe get some of these landlords who are just running the home for profit to convert it to you know home occupancy uh, you know we're just starting to get some of the data and the program's only been in place now for a couple of years but the early indications are that you know we're starting to see some people convert you know rentals to condos or townhomes or something to that effect where people actually are living on site so hopefully within the year you'll see us take that next step and you know that would be a further tool that we would utilize to try and thwart rooming houses and illegal apartments. Uh, we had a question, I think it was Jackie? Yeah, I actually have two questions. My first is, um, I live in Ward 3, as everyone knows, on Belgium Street, and I, I don't know a lot of my neighbors, and it's not for lack of trying, I can tell you that. But I've been there 16 years, and I do see a lot of, you know, strange people walking around the neighborhood, you know, frequently enough, whether it be during the day or at night. I want to know from the police department if the calls are taken seriously, if, is, is there such a thing as two, I mean, not that I'm going to call the police department 10 days, 10 times a week reporting a stranger walking down my street, but my concern is that um, would the calls be taken seriously? Would a car be sent out if I felt that there was somebody walking around that I, I hadn't seen before? Um, you know, I don't want to jump the gun and call irrationally, saying, you know, maybe it's not a serious situation, but it could be. Well, so, it might be somebody walking down the street looking into automobiles. Most certainly call about something like that. Somebody walking onto somebody's property and then walking back out, most certainly call and things like that. But are you going to take it upon yourself if somebody just happens to be walking down the street one time only? I don't know about that. That's a judgment call you're going to have to make. But if the person most certainly goes up and down the street about six or seven times, now that would be something, you know, we'd like to know about. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. those kind of things, yeah. But, you know, we rely on you as neighbors to you be reasonable and prudent yeah. on what you may or may not call into us. <coughs> but we want to hear from you. If it raises your radar, so to speak, then we want to know about it, too. Might be nothing, but at least if we know about it, we're going to come out most surely. Okay. Second question, Jack. Um, my second question was, and this is kind of directed to John too, um, about the res. Well, fells me upon. Um, I really want to walk down there at night, and I don't because m many times I've been down there, the lights have been broken. You know, there are vandal vandalism to the lights where they they throw the rocks up and break the light bulbs. Okay, so I think my question would be. Will there be any measures taken in the future for maybe some kind of emergency lighting or maybe some kind of glass that's unbreakable so that we feel safe walking around down there? I mean, that's, it's been there for, you know, it's a fixture in Malden, you know, it's a beautiful place to be, um, to walk and to take it all in, especially at night when people can't do it during the day. Um, and would there be a possibility, and I know this is asking a lot, I mean we have fire alarms around that we can pull in case of an emergency, God forbid, or if you don't have your cell phone, you can't call 911. Um, would there be a call box, maybe, to police, direct line to police, um, that's locked, uh, not locked, but is access to public, and hopefully wouldn't be used for non, you know, emergency situations, people aren't going to use it just to, you know, play around with it, but just a couple of ideas thrown out there to know if that's going to be a safer place to walk at night. Right, if one of the panel wants that first. I'll, I'll, I'll take that matters. briefly. Um, I know that the mayor is uh, now about to tackle the budget for the uh, fiscal year. Right. And, uh, there is going to be money in there for improvements to Fellsmere Pond. And that pond in Park is one of the most beautiful places in Malden. It's, uh, it's dear to all of us. Right. Um, one of the things we're going to be doing on the 29th is talking about how we can uh, improve that area. 
and lighting is definitely going to be a, a, one of the topics. I do see that there's a police presence down there quite often in the evening hours after the sun goes down. Uh, I, I can't tell you, you know, what the schedule is for that, but uh, that might be something worth exploring more uh, in the future. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, do you ready to hand up and then we'll go back there, okay? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I live on Hawthorne Street and I've lived in Malden my whole life and I've been up here since 78. I think part of the problem we're facing in that area is it's, it's a residential single family area. What we have now is single family homes rented out to who knows who. We're never notified who lives in there. They come, they go. Um, I think it's actually quite dangerous that, that that's our situation now. And um, I think we need to address it because it's become serious. And, and as people said here, these have turned into rooming houses and who knows what else. People are coming, going, cars from other states. And, you know, I think, <coughs> I have to say your office is great and I've dealt with them already and it's been a breath of fresh air because I think people are listening. But that's a concern I take seriously and my husband takes seriously as to whether we'll stay in Malden Will we spend any money on our house? I don't know. Because what I'm seeing is, is not positive right now. And we need some help to figure out how are we gonna do this and make it work for the people who are serious about living here, who take care of their homes, who respect their property and their neighbor's properties, and who will support us when we're losing thousands of dollars per day because of this and it's crime infested now because of it. Yeah, well you, you know, you hit the nail on the head, we need you. I mean, you're 80% of our tax base, so that's why, you know, I for one, plus I think my experience as a ward counselor, and I know uh, the counselor in the back, Neil Kinnon's dealt with it as well. It, it, it can crush a block, it can crush a neighborhood, it can crush, a, it can crush the city. So I have seen it firsthand, so again, I'd ask you to, you know, please hang in there. In the next several weeks, you're going to see some changes coming out of City Hall that are really going to, you know, address uh, the problem you've identified. Uh, another thing, if you go on the transition report tomorrow, citymalton.org, the last section, again, addresses the Housing Task Force. One thing in there that caught my, yeah, the one thing that kind of blew my, uh, that caught my attention was there's no real central place for you to get us the information we need to take the next steps. Uh, I think at one count, if I'm not mistaken, there were three different phone numbers. So again, we need to just come up with a central repository that you can either call or that you can either email, which would allow us to get the ball rolling. And I think, well, I um, yeah. People have given up up there because I think people have complained and had very serious issues with the neighbors and the neighbors. And it's fallen on deaf ears right. all over the place. Well, that's why I asked those people to please yeah. just hang in there. I've only been in four weeks. No, we don't expect <laughs> you to <laughs> I said that to you. We don't expect you just go out there. This is not, this is something that's been coming. It feels like I've been 40 years. For 20 years. This is a 20 year problem. This is an MBTA problem that we've had here. So we understand that this is not something, but we also yeah, understand did, uh, it's serious. One thing we did in Ward 1 that I plan to also do citywide is that, you know, I let the neighbors know in that area what properties were on the task force. So anybody that was living nearby, they served as another set of eyes and ears on the home. I thought that helped uh, with us, re you know, getting resolution on some of the property. So and again, is there a way for the people who own the homes and live here to know who just moved in next door here? Who just left three months ago? Now there's two more cars from Connecticut. Who are these people that are living next door to me? Is there a way that we can be notified? Look. This house is rented, and this is who it's rented to, and these are your neighbors. Yeah, I mean, because these people well, don't speak to any. We don't even know yeah, yeah. Make a pie and who they are. Yeah. No, we do, but they no, just, just come and they go. No, I, I mean, have the to other, say the other thing, uh, if we can, I just I want to get to the gentleman in the back. Yeah. But let me just end on this. The other thing that you know we're working on, Council Matheson and the department, um, you know, we're now starting to really hone in on the bank-owned properties as well. Uh, you know, they're a majority of the, uh, the issues we're having across the city. So there is movement afoot now to, you know, require them 
to place money in an escrow account so an escrow account so we can maintain the home. And then there's also another provision that's being challenged in court right now, but I think it's a, a worthy provision. That is, before a house goes into foreclosure, you know, there are a couple steps that need to be taken before the house goes into foreclosure, and that is that would allow, you know, Malden and other cities and towns to work with the the property owner in the bank to maybe come up with something other than the house being vacated and converted to something that we don't want. So everything's on the table. Uh, you're going to see this administration with the council and the police department being very aggressive because I know if we don't, then you know we may not see you here at the next meeting. So I understand what's at stake here. And I would just ask you to give us a little bit of time to put some things in place and hopefully you'll see you know, some improvement when it comes to that uh, issue. Let me go to the back. Thank you. Yep. Uh, two quick headers. What I just thought of actually, you know, thoughts for resident sticker programs to keep the out of towners from coming in. And secondly, um, probably pretty expensive, but is any thought to uh, strategic, strategic cameras being placed in problematic areas? All right, let's take up the second question first, which is the cameras. Yeah, there is, there are cameras out there in strategic locations oh, now. now. Yeah, there are. Traffic park well, there are some in certain areas we don't want to post them all, so we will avoid them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know. But we have the ability to do some panning with some of them and some zooming with some of them. And some of them are fixed. But in general, throughout most of the city, uh, that was step one. Step two is to move out further into some of the more outlying areas. Um, we'll see if the budget will prevail on that issue also. That's another issue on the side from personnel. Right. is the ordinary maintenance of these type of initiatives. Because once you get into anything that's in this day and age that involves anything to do with technology, it's expensive and it's reoccurring expense. It does, you just don't put it in and let it operate for years. You have to put it in. You've got to update it probably every year or two, depending on what you get. So your, your investment is going to be long term. You're not just going to put something out there and say, oh, we got cameras. You've got to follow it up with uh, investment and Pretty much like anything else, you got to service your automobile. It's the same thing with that. You got to service, and that has to be built into the budget. Those kinds of things are going to be crucial to how we move forward with the technology part of it. Because the technology is good, but you've got to keep up to date with it. As we all know, you can buy a PC now, put it in your house. Six months later, it's outdated. So. Really, cost is a big thing. I just want to keep it deterrent. Yes, it uh, it's been proven over the years that they are deterrent. You know, and there are some at some parks now and there will be more, hopefully, in the second phase. And Chief, you at liberty to say how many we have up and around the city, or no? <clears throat> I believe we're around the 30 mark, depending on the operability and the times of what's going on, because um, it is a new system. There are still some bugs in it, so right. we have as many as 30 operating from a day-to-day -day basis. So it could be less. Right. So. Let's tackle his uh, first question. I know the police weighed in on this question about a residential uh, sticker program last year. Do you want to lead off? Or? Well, I think the council, that's within the council's right. privilege, yeah. so I'm going to dump it right back on them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll enforce whatever they want to. Well, the council wasn't even there, thankfully, but, uh, you know, it is still a uh, pending proposal. It's with the city council, as the <coughs> chief uh, mentioned. Um, we just couldn't get any type of consensus last year on uh, it was mainly the number of you know visitor stickers and I think the times were still you know somewhat um, debatable across the city but uh, you know if you look around the other cities and towns you know Everett's doing it uh, some of us doing it Cambridge is doing it so you know it's a tool that the uh, police indicated in public testimony last year that would uh, aid them and um, you know so we went around the city and tried to um, you know, try to get a consensus from the residents and we were unable to do so. But the council president, uh, Judy Bucci, you know, has indicated early on that it's a proposal they might pull back out now that the new session has started and to see if we can get anywhere with, um, you know, maybe going down that road. And Other questions? Just comment, a side comment on that. As you well know, the residents of Ward 3, is a great part of Ward 3 already has a, some sort of a sticker program, you know, for the daytime part. Right. Uh, and I think that they were using that as a model, right. if I'm not correct. They are, they, yeah. They, and they I think what, um, that, so. yeah, and I think what we thought, you know, particularly, um, you know, Councilor Kinnan and I last year is that, uh, you know, it would really help us that, you know, if we, if the police, if we got a call, Councilor Kinnan and I, 
that there was a, you know, a crazy party out of control in a particular area, and the uh, police were sent down, and um, you know, they just went down the street, and you know, 20 of those cars didn't have stickers. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna be tagged, and chances are that they, they're gonna break up because, you know, $25, $50 fine. You know, that, that will have some bearing on, you know, how long that um, party lasts. I think the other thing that would help us too is that, um, and, you know, the counselor who was also chair of public safety at the city council instituted a couple of years ago is, and this will come up with the task force too, this is talking about streamlining the issues. We have this great ordinance on the books that, you know, if the police are called on a disturbance of the peace call, you know, we have a level of fines in place now for the first time. And, um, you know, we need to figure out how to make sure that all that information is being tied back to the location. Uh, I don't think we're doing a very good job with that right now, and uh, it's something that we need to do to take the next step with identifying, you know, these homes that are having parties or, you know, rooming houses or what have you. So, you know, it's another thing we're hoping to do. But if you have thoughts on the residential sticker parking program, you should forward them to your respective city councilor uh, or the mayor's office for that matter. Um, and we'll see what happens from there. Other questions? Uh, why don't we, um, I'm sorry, have one over here, then we're gonna come to Amy, then we'll go in the back there. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I work with the MBTA, but I'm not here on behalf of the MBTA because I'm one step ahead of the guy that cleans the toilets over there. So what we can do, or one of my suggestions would be to, around the mall of the Tennessee, circumvent city, uh, I mean not city hall, uh, Beacon Hill, because the majority of the state lawmakers and representatives are criminal right advocates. So we have to do it on a local level in the ordinance that like speeding infractions, loitering would be a, 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 a financial, like to increase the fine. Mm -hmm. That's one suggestion. <coughs> okay. And uh, also, yeah, go ahead. Also, I'd like to see the uh, commercial vehicle Let me get traffic. Let's turn it over to the panel. So commercial vehicle enforcement and then maybe a transit zone around the T. Increase the fines. Yeah. The loitering and anything else that goes on around the VIP station. Okay. Let's get comments from the lieutenant and the chief. Well, first, uh, uh, as you all know, the MPTA has its own rules and regulations and their own jurisdictional issues that the city of Malton can't impose fines and impose things on anything on their property. In or about anything to change any speed limits or anything. If there are anything outside of the ordinary, even reducing them, you have to go to the state law. If they're not within, if they're not a 30 mile an hour, or even to get a 20 mile an hour zone, you have to go to the state to go through a large petitions to do that. Um, we also, we all, Malden has its own disorderly conduct uh, fines and such as that, which we do use. Instead of the state statute, we use the city ordinance when we do run into these difficulties down there. But um, as far as the jurisdictional issues, um, the MBTA has made us some promises and for the most part kept it up last year. They brought a lot of people out here. They had the canine uh, dog out here quite a bit. They had the officers out here, but in fairness to them, they're under the gun too. They're, they're running a budget, huge budget deficit. So I meet once a month with the MBTA chief. We go over issues. We have some discussions. Um, as soon as the weather breaks again, which hasn't really been a problem and that's why we're seeing a lot of high activity is people are out and about like it's still early fall out. It's not like a winter right now. You know, last year at this time we had four or five feet of snow. This year we don't, which I'm thankful for, but on the other hand it does allow for people to come out and be about as if it were early, early uh, fall. So those kind of things contribute to a lot of people out and about and around the train stations such as that. Uh, on their property, we call them consistently, don't we, Kevin? We do watch them quite a bit in that area, so uh, Kevin alluded to earlier in the conversation, uh, Lieutenant spends a lot of time down there. So we are aware of that. Do you want to add anything on the commercial vehicle? The commercial vehicles, all our officers are still empowered to do, to do commercial vehicle. We can't, by law, do inspections since the state police do those. They're required by law to do the inspections and certifications of vehicles. 
So we don't do that. But we are enforcing out on the street the commercial vehicle overnight ban. Yeah, the overnight parking ban and the commercial vehicle operational ban that they can, as far as we can do. Okay, Lieutenant, you want to add anything to that? Or? Uh, just to kind of echo what the chief said, with regard to the, the, the T station, uh, my, my group particularly spends a, a lot of time there. Unfortunately for us, we might not be that visible because we wear plain clothes. But one of the things that we do, and we, we have a, a very good relationship with the officers from the MBTA who work that area, um, we, do, we do spend a lot of time in that area to have conversations with and seek to identify people that are just frequenting the, the T area, not necessarily waiting for a bus. The, the idea is if you can uh, walk up to someone and identify them through legal means or have a conversation with them, it could minimize the potential that they are contemplating committing a crime later on. Um, it's almost a psychological thing. If you can develop some familiarity with someone, you can take away their level of comfort in an area, and then you can take away the comfort level with which they would uh, choose to uh, victimize someone. Uh, we were very lucky over the summer. We apprehended someone who committed a mugging of a woman who was coming home from work from the train station late at night. Um, I believe she was selected because she was in the area at night. The perpetrators saw her walking from the train station, followed her, and uh, uh, picked up on, on, on the fact that she was alone in an area that was dark. <coughs> so, I mean, getting back to what the chief said and, you know, what, what you know, the mayor endorses, spending time around the, tree, the, the tea station and identifying people that frequent that area is a great step toward um, preventing crime and also being able to solve future crimes if we can put a name to a, to a description. So. Uh, we do have a pretty good relationship with the T police in, in, in that area, but it's an area we definitely uh, focus our, our, our time on. Thank you. Amy? Yeah, I just had a question. Um, I live up off Down Street, well, on Down Street Extension. We had some activity up there around the holidays. Um, guy and a girl knocking on doors, checking on puppies and so forth. And I'm just wondering if anything ever came of that, because we never heard, <coughs> excuse me, any more about I'd have, to, I'd have to look that up and get back to you. Okay, we're just curious. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me go in the back. I think uh, you had a question. Yes, it's just to follow up on the conversation about cameras. I live on Ward 6, and, and I was very interested in hearing about all the um, the organized incidents. And I apologize if I can belong in here, but um, I'm very curious. I don't understand cameras well. Uh, you mentioned something about license readers, and I wonder the role of the cameras that are above traffic lights. Um, are they on? I had a conversation the other day with Council Kenyon, and he was explaining to me that not all, not all of them are on, um, not all of them are available in, in the radar yes, for the no. city. Yeah, the ones, some cameras that are on top of lights, on uh, light poles <laughs> are actually just a tripping meter to show that you're pulling up and changing the lights. Not all of those cameras are actually cameras, they're just sort of an infrared to when you pull up the set of lights, and it will show that a car has come up to that point and then click the, uh, the sequence of light changing so that the, the, uh, the uh, lights know electronically to change because there's a car pulling up there. That's basically what that is. On most of them, um, there are some license plate readers within the, the city that are up and operating uh, right now, and we have them on the backs of cruises. You'll see the cars running down the street, the little black things sitting on the back of them. And we do utilize those. But the majority of the newer intersections that have uh, electronic eyeballs on top of them, those you can't see anything out of. They're just there to sense the car coming up to trip the uh, lights to change for them so they can go forward. Gloria, That's basically what it is. They used to use the they used to put it in the street a lot years ago. They dig holes in the street and they put like a sensor. But now they do it up top. And so you see the tall, it's on a long skinny pole. Mm -hmm. You're talking about those things sitting on it? Yeah. There's the kind that had the four different angles. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, that's yeah. the trip. Because of the older ones, how the sign that says stop here on red. Yeah, that's, like that. Those are the ones that are too late. Yeah. But any of the ones that you 
can see on the top of the light bulb hanging out the newer one, those are just a trip for the cars pulling up so the lights will change and allow them to move forward. That's basically what that is. Okay, other uh, questions? Those that haven't asked for the first time, why don't we go here, then we'll go here. David? So, um, my question is, <coughs> Bunch of the handouts right up here. There's several different ways you can do it. Right. Tip 411. Uh, you can do what we just developed from my app that has gone out to some droids and, uh, and iPhones. And uh, you can always do the email one. There's a million ways. And we have a drug hotline and a tip line that we can utilize. It, those things are out there. So uh, I believe there's some pamphlets right up front around machine. here someplace. Now, now is, that, is that instantaneous? Though? Oh, yeah. If someone's walking yeah. home from the and if they don't feel comfortable. Uh, yeah, they can text it to the tip one more one, it'll come through. Okay. Yeah. We do not monitor it. Somebody doesn't sit there like this monitoring it. Because it's just too labor intensive, but they do get checked kind of time. They'll pop up on our email. A tip has been received. We have to do that. I encourage you, if it's an immediate crime taking place, dial the 911. Sure. Click it on 911. I have a problem here. You gotta do it. It, it, texting is taking valuable time away from something could get worse instead of you know, helping the situation. So I, I would advise you to call as best. That's our best response is call right away. And just, just to follow up on Jack's uh, question, um, if we see something which is suspicious but it's not necessarily a crime, would you recommend calling, you know, if you make that judgment call and say, you know, this doesn't look right, but we don't actually witness some a crime in progress, would you, would you recommend calling that one or calling the law police and the number? You can call the name main number for those types of things that you, you know. Right. You know but, uh, you know, if you, again, this is going to use your awareness and train yourself to understand what's different in your neighborhood, what doesn't look right, your neighbor's gone away, and now there's a strange car back in the yard. We want to know that kind of thing. Those are the kind of things, the things that jump out at you and say, that's not right in my neighborhood. We, we all have to do that for each other. <coughs> Basically, right. it's a team effort here. All right, does that answer your question? Before we uh, get to the next question, show of hands. Oh, that would end, right? Right. The kids are calling. Yeah, we're, we're just yeah. very, very early on, you know, maybe looking at something we might be able to do, um, you know, within our city to, you know, help uh, on that issue. Um, the chief and the lieutenant um, and the council, for that matter, have been pushing, you know, I think what was mentioned in the fall, and that is trying to see if we can work with some of these companies to um, you know, see if we can lessen the cost and maybe down the road see if we can have some of these alarms go um, you know, right to our city, to our station. Um, it's very early on, but I think some of the problems that the police have identified is that you might have the greatest security system in place, but when it trips, you know, it might go somewhere here to Texas or Utah and then back to the police. And, you know, I think that, you know, those are valuable seconds and minutes that, you know, might be lost. So we're toying, you know, with the idea of seeing we can bridge that gap. Uh, so we'll keep you posted on uh, that concept as well. So let me get to your question. I'm sorry for the delay. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, a couple of things. You said that you would have an online forum at 10 a.m. Yes. And that you'd have another one at 10 a.m.? Yes. Is it always going to be at 10 a.m.? Yes. Fourth uh, Friday uh, of each month. We, we, you know, what if we, you can't go online at 10 a.m.? Right. Well, if you can't, uh, we replay. You know, you can go on and uh, view the entire transcript uh -huh. anytime you want. But if you actually want to participate, yeah. you know, we could. You know, maybe we could do one on the weekends. I'll bring that back to the group at sit, at the mayor's office. See if we can uh, mix them up a little bit. You know, maybe have one on the weekend. Maybe one at night. Yeah. Yeah. I'll make sure that happens. All right. I'll make sure that happens. All right. The other thing is. I have a question, and I'm not sure who I ask here, but the issue of cabs parked on the city streets all night long, what's, is that, what's the deal with that? That's Can they do that? Good. I mean, if you're a bus driver, you can't bring your bus home, but <coughs> these people are bringing their cabs home, and they're parking them on the street. Yeah. 
Yeah, right okay. now it's the uh, the Overnight Parking Regulations that they tag for Overnight Park. Uh, although the City of Everett indicated they have a program where the cats have to pay a large fee in order to be able to stay overnight if they're within a certain, I don't know if they're six passenger or something, or smaller or bigger, I don't know, but there's a certain criteria that the City of Everett's developed apparently to raise some revenues in order for a cat to park overnight. So those are some things that are out there to kind of do that. But right now they get tagged on the overnight parking only. But every other day they can park just like a, a normal car, you know, every time during the day. So, so if you're talking about overnight, correct? Yes, and it's, it's, it's for at least the past five years it's been out there. Yeah, you should steer that information to the police or your ward counselor, and uh, the chief's been very good about um, when there is a, you know, something coming from the city council, they, you know, or the residents, they'll get right on it. So, you know, what would help us is the address, you know, time that it's happening typically, uh, any other information that would make it easier for them to enforce. So if I have questions about the residential sticker program, I am going to ask because I <laughs> <laughs> <Do> you what? Anytime. <laughs> yeah. um, I personally, I live on Dexter Street, and the street lighting is an atrocious. It's pitch dark all the time. It's terrible. I mean, before we start putting cameras everywhere, we should really talk about street lights. Now, are there existing lights with not working or just? They're, sometimes they're out and it takes forever to get it fixed and turned on and it's yeah. an act of Congress to call the people because you have to call, they call, you have to call three different people. Right. That's been my experience with it. And um, they're, they're very old, they're very spread out too far for, the lighting distance right. and the circumference, and they're and they're old. They're not. I'm sure yeah, they're not yeah, energy I efficient. Need to put this on John, but that's you got to utilize the council. We have a you know direct um, link to National Grid uh, constituent person who's responsible for <coughs> working with us on repairing street lights or even adding street lights for that matter. So, you know, I'm sure that's something uh, we can work together on. <coughs> yeah. Other questions. And just a quick question about Please, the Homewood Pharmacy. Um, that seems like it extends the realm of the sphere of the bike, the MBTA station, and there's a lot of hanging out in front of that. Oh, yeah. Just wondering if that has been, if you have any dealings with the owner of that building, okay. if there's any chance of upgrading that. Yeah, we, we deal with it on occasion. We deal with them, and we, it's a business. People have a right to go in and out. You know, we try to identify, as the lieutenant said, certain people. We walk up and strike up conversations. Once you get to know who people are, it takes the ambiguity out of how they can do their business and maybe that moves them on. You have to be balancing people's individual rights here too. You know, it's not just we go clean them up because we don't like them or we don't like them hanging out. They have to be doing something wrong, things have to be, you know, there are some constitutional issues that we have to be guided by also too. So you all have the right to go where you need to go. You know, unless you're doing something wrong, we don't have the right to interfere with that. So, as I say, being proactive, going out and discussing just local issues with these particular people that might be hanging out, maybe we get to think a little differently. That's but obviously one of those energy concerns. Oh, yeah, right. consistently. Uh, other questions? Great. Quick question. Um, going back to uh, when you had said you were at the train station and you see, you know, some people maybe following other people home. And with that, and also with um, the break-ins, have these perpetrators been from Boston, other towns, or have any of them been Malden residents, Malden teenagers um, that have been doing these things? Uh, it, it, it varies. With regard to the two the other day that we caught in Edgeworth, they indicated they were homeless. Uh, last address was the, you know, the Pine Street Inn. Uh, no belief that they came here by vehicle, so there, there is a possibility that they use public transportation to get here. Uh, with regard to the one that I had mentioned where the guy broke in and stole some jewelry back a few months ago, he did have a vehicle and as I said a neighbor was able to write down the plate number accurately enough to uh, lead us you know, to, to that vehicle. Um, so I mean, there, there's a mixed blend. I, I would say, though, that in my opinion, many of them are uh, 
varying their targeting not only Malden, they do it in other communities as well, so that there would not necessarily be a strong Malden <coughs> basis on, on uh, a lot of things that have been happening happen. People from outside Malden coming in, targeting, doing these things, and then heading back, whether it be train or. Yeah, on, on a number of occasions, the perpetrators are not uh, people that are from the community. They have came, they have come here to commit crimes. As many people uh, that use drugs, you know, come to another community to purchase drugs. So there's not necessarily a Malden connection to the uh, people committing all these these type of crimes. I think the other thing we're hoping to do too, and you should be you should do it now, is if you have a chance to comb the police logs on a weekly basis, which are in the local papers. I think they're on the police website. I've always found those to be a useful, you know, tool to be able to know what's going on around you. Um, I did it in Ward 1. What I'm hoping to do citywide is to make it easier on you and kind of break out um, those occurrences and put them in some type of um, way that you can see them, just what's impacting your neighborhood as opposed to now, which is you really got to go through the list and something's got to pop out of you to realize that there's something happening in your area of the city. So, you know, I think the more information, the better. So that's what we're going to be doing the next four years is really trying to get you, you know, the information that you need so that we're all sort of working together here. Uh, it's um, 7.15, let me see, 7.20 almost. So we got a few more minutes, and then we'll uh, wrap it up tonight. Jack, go ahead. No, I'm just yeah. <laughs> Got to get used to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very quick, I promise. It's not really a crime issue, it's a safety issue. With the caps, I've been meaning to say this um, for quite some time. The caps that are parked in front of Malden train station, they literally have their own lane in a two lane, two lanes on that street. Okay, I have to say, that is a big concern to me, especially during the heavy traffic times. Yeah. In the morning and at rush hour at night. They have their own spots to park, they and park. you have to pull away so that you can merge with the other lane to get by. Yeah. That is a public street, two lanes. Why are they allowed to park there? When there's an inlet at the T, that they could line up right there. Why do they have to line up on the street? That's my big, big concern. I think when the city planners and the MBTA lined it up, maybe that's how they did it. And they it doesn't say it. taxes here. Huh? It does not. It doesn't say taxes here. Well, it is designated there because there's only certain ones that can be out there. Um, the property for the MBTA actually extends out further than what you see. So they actually maintain that. And they won't allow the cabs to be in the drop-off area. Right. Uh, that's their property. And they'll allow them in the drop-off on the inner side. Mm -hmm. But in order to stand, they can stand out there legally. For whatever yeah. it is the council wants to revisit, how they initially did I'm always open to whatever the, the city wants. But right. it's been that way since they put the station there. Did you have an idea, changed. Jackie? No, the vehicle and the inlet. I didn't even want to ask the question because when you talked earlier how about that was MBTA property and that the city really doesn't have a lot of say in what's going on there. I honestly don't um, because we still have an issue with Dunkin' Donuts too. They pull over and run out and get their coffee and it's clearly designated. They can't pull over. I'll let you check that out. We were tagging the heck out. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. Don't make any friends over. <laughs> right, right, right. So, and then of course they can't go across the street because that's the official parking um, for the city hall, where you can run in and yeah, do a quick errand. Right. You know, so. Well, we'll see what happens. I mean, you know, we've been talking about what to do with that building. So, you know, hopefully in a couple of years it'll change. Uh, the one thing uh, while you bring it up, though, that uh, we're happy is that um, uh, there is a new restaurant that's taken uh, over right next to uh, the Dunkin' Donuts there. So. That's right. Yeah. Mexican. Yeah, I think Mexican lingo. Yeah, so it'll be opening up pretty soon. Other uh, questions? We have just a few more minutes to go. It's not a question, but I just wanted to thank the Malden Police Department uh, because um, I had a sick child uh, with a lot of medication at my house uh, for a few years. Our address is known because of fundraisers that were done, and her name has been in the local papers, and it would be very easy to connect the dots and see where those medications would be. I had reason to, I, I saw somebody, uh, you know, scoping out my house, and uh, they just didn't happen to notice me, but I had been bringing my garbage out. It was just so circumstantial. But I called the police, and um, I described exactly what he did. And then he, the person got out of their car, and they walked past my house, and they were on the cell phone talking uh, about looking at my house. And I was just so sure that something was going to happen. 
And uh, it was actually near the change of shift and the police came. And he stayed beyond the change of shift because he, uh, and he had, I saw him get out and, and speak to the uh, person in the red car. And that person, after they were done, the person took off very quickly. And I've never seen that car again. So I really think that that was, that that was something bad was going to happen. And, um, and the policeman involved uh, stayed beyond <coughs> the shift uh, because he was sort of all over it from right before the end of the shift. So I wanted to thank you for that. attack it is, you know, with you. So I want to end by, you know, sort of how we began, and that is saying thank you for taking the time out to be with us tonight. Uh, once again, I'd like to remind you the next uh, forum will be Monday, February 27th at 6 p.m. at the Oak Grove Community Center. So we'll be here for a few minutes after if you have uh, other information you want to share with us. But again, uh, thank you for choosing Malden as your home, and we look forward to working with you moving forward. Thank you. Thank you.